notwithstanding an elaborate note in page 125 through 6, wherein the author describes the new house preparing for Napoleon under such favorable colors. I have no hesitation in saying that it is placed in a situa situation nearly as bleak and exposed as that of the old barn. It is equally destitute of shade or water, while on the spot chosen to erect it on is decidedly contrary to the known desire of Napoleon, who, when applied to for his opinion on this subject by Sir Hudson Lowe, replied that though generals, Monson, Bertrand, and myself, that if he intended to build a new house, let him build it in a place where there was shade, verdure, and water, and sheltered from the sharp trade wind, that the application thus made to Napoleon was a mere mockery is evident from the result, which he had so clearly foreseen. Moreover, when finished, the insalubrity of a new and damp building will be united to all the local inconveniences of the old residence. In January last, Napoleon, who had not been out of the house for nearly six months before, walked out and viewed the new building constructing for him. After considering it with attention, he desired General Monson to communicate to the orderly officer that he would never inhabit it. C.L. A. pour lui, said General Monson, Captain Nichols, comme cela n'est pas de tout, il me charge de vous déclarer qu'elle est tout à fait incroyable et qui ne habitera jamais. Napoleon says he's never going to live there. Had it been the intention of Sir Hudson Lowe, or Lord Bathurst, to have rendered Napoleon as comfortable as this wretched island might allow, he would have been accommodated either in Plantation House, the only good mansion on the island, or at least a house could have been built for him at Rosemary Hall or Colonel Smith's, where there is some shade and water, and which are sheltered from the bleak southeast wind. Napoleon, in consequence of the great sensibility of the membranes of his nose, a fact well known to all those who have ever been about his person is extremely susceptible to catarrh, of which complaint he has had several attacks, some of a very violent nature. For this reason, the unsheltered and bleak situation of Longwood renders it most obviously an improper and unhealthy residence for him, as was evinced by the frequent severe colds and other inflammatory affections which he experienced when he did go out. The deleterious effects of the sharp trade when, even upon vegetable life, is exposed situations like Longwood has been satisfactorily proved in page 33 on the authority of the actual senior member of the Council of St. Helena and clearly manifests that any attempt to procure shade there by means of trees must be fruitless. Some remarkable occurrences attended upon my departure from St. Helena tend so strongly to manifest the manner in which justice is administered in that colony, and I feel it incumbent upon me to lay them before the public. While occupied on the 25th of July, 1818, in preparing the medicines which I left with Napoleon's valet de chambre and in explaining to him the manner in which they should be administered to his master, Lieutenant Colonel Winyard, Sir Hudson Lowe's military secretary, went to my apartments and without my knowledge took upon himself to order my servants to pack up my effects, which they were compelled to do with the utmost precipitation. And in open trunks, on returning to my apartment, I put what money I had in gold, amounting to about 200 pounds, in my pocket, and consigned six or seven hundred dollars to Captain Blakeney, the orderly officer, with a request that he would send them to me on the following morning. I also took two snuff boxes, given to me by Napoleon, and hung a valuable cameo to my watch chain. Several articles of jewelry, some of considerable value, I put in my writing desk in the presence of three witnesses and then left Logwood after having received a specific promise from Lieutenant Colonel Winyard, to whom in the presence of my servants I had explained the insecure and open state of my trunks that one of them should be permitted to remain with my baggage at Hut's Gate. Farther than which... The lieutenant colonel informed me that he would not allow it to be taken that night. Instead of this promise being fulfilled, the moment I departed from Longwood, Lieutenant Colonel Winyard galloped on 
the hut's gate, where he waited until the arrival of my baggage, which he compelled my servants to give up to some person in the government employ, and to proceed themselves to town forthwith, directing, however, one of them to return in the morning with a promise that it should be delivered to him. Accordingly, the next day, Jones, my groom, went up in obedience to these directions and pursuant to a signal made to that effect from Plantation House. But upon his arrival, instead of receiving my baggage, he was seized, thrown into a guardroom and imprisoned there without being permitted to even see my property. The following day, I reported myself to Rear Admiral Plampin, by whose secretary, Mr. Elliot, I was informed by the Admiral's direction that I was to proceed to England in the Griffin Sloop of War, permission was then given to me by the Admiral to remain on shore until that ship was ready to sail. On my return to town, being desirous to see whatever surgeon might be appointed to attend at Longwood, I wrote to Major Gorker for the governor's information, acquainting him that I had recommended to Napoleon for medical gentlemen, from amongst whom I had advised him to choose a surgeon. This letter was returned to me unopened. The following morning, soon after having dispatched it, Mr. Weston, the jailer of the common prison of the island, came and informed me that he was ordered by Sir Hudson Lowe to see me off the island in an hour's time, and that I must not proceed farther up the town than the spot on which I was then standing. I demanded his authority. He showed me a written order to that effect of which he allowed me to take a copy in which he attested himself. No farther communication with any friend was allowed me. At a signal having been made for a lieutenant of the Griffin, I proceeded on board of that vessel guarded by the jailer uh, and then dogged by two police spies after having preferred a complaint to Mr. Brooke, the actual senior member of council against the illegality of the measures adopted towards me. The following morning, I received intimation my baggage had been secretly rummaged and my papers examined at Hut's Gate. None of my creditors or debtors were allowed access to me, nor was I permitted to proceed on shore to them in order to settle my accounts. And an officer of the 66th Regiment, who, my application to Brigadier General Sir George Bingham to the governor, was allowed to transact my affairs, but not permitted to come on board in order to obtain the necessary information for that purpose for me. Several of the army officers and of the most respectable inhabitants who applied for permission to come on board to see me were refused with asperity and menaces. But as it was not in Sir Hudson Lowe's power to prevent naval officers from visiting me, he was obliged to content himself with placing a spy on Ladder Hill with orders to report the names of all the persons who visited the Griffin, amongst whom were to be found nearly the whole of the officers of the squadron of all ranks.